Have you ever wondered what the future of the world would look like if we embraced the power of design? We have enormous global challenges to deal with, and I think that the design industry could potentially create a solution for these. We have climate change. We have an increase of refugees from climate change or war-torn countries. Carbon emissions are continuously expanding. And we're on the verge of the beginning of biodiversity collapse. We have the technology to live anywhere on the planet. In some of the coldest environments with mechanical heating, in some of the hottest environments with mechanical cooling. We understand that the Earth is getting hotter. Continuously across the globe, we are seeing temperatures on an annual basis breaking. We're seeing unprecedented forest fires in the Amazon, in Europe, in the Arctic, Australia, and different parts of the United States. And it's only getting worse. The way that we look at water needs to change. If you look at this map, you'll see that the largest blue sphere is actually the amount of salt water that exists on the planet. The smaller blue sphere is the amount of fresh water that exists on the planet. And that very teeny blue dot that you see there is the amount of drinkable water that exists on the planet. If you talk to an average person on the street, they'll say, oh yeah, well, the Earth's made of 70% water. But it, it's actually covered in 70% of water. And our perception with water needs to change. Today, we have two billion people on the planet with too much water. And it's mostly causing flooding, different challenges from sea level rise, we have another two billion people without enough. And we have the resources to tackle a lot of these issues. Without water, there essentially is no life. And the more we try to control our water by developing these enormous infrastructure projects, the more our water really controls us. This is a photo of Southern California, where we are literally shipping water from a, a northern part of Canada just to feed our crops. The Arctic is melting, and we all know this. Some scientists actually believe that it could lead up to six meters of sea level rise at some point in time. When that will actually happen, we're not really sure, but it is a scientific possibility. This is a photo of me in Iceland in 2008. One of the biggest mind-blowing facts for me was knowing that the glacier that I was standing on in the bottom right-hand corner, that space no longer exists today. We're seeing hurricanes consistently costing us billions of dollars. Hurricane Andrew in the early 1990s, $27 billion. Hurricane Katrina, 2005, $150 billion. Hurricane Sandy, $90 billion in 2012. Hurricane Harvey, $125 billion in 2017. Hurricane Maria, $90 billion in 2017. The Texas winter storm, $130 billion in 2021. Over the past 25 years, the United States alone has spent over a trillion dollars in revitalization efforts from extreme storms events. So what is resilience? And why as designers do we have a responsibility? Well, we have a responsibility as licensed professionals to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public. So for the health, it's about securing physical, biological, mental health of building and landscape occupants. For safety, it's about addressing the building and landscape structural compromise, the physical safety of occupants. And for welfare, it's about social equity and long-term survival of us as a human species. The AIA has an enormous presence on this, and they believe that architects have a responsibility to design a resilient environment. Recently, the AIA released this document, which is a part of the contract system, which essentially is a hazard and climate risk assessment. What it does is it gathers the architects, the engineers, the developer, everybody involved with the project, and it essentially allows folks to have a conversation about the future climate projections. Do we understand them? What are they? What are the vulnerabilities and dependencies associated with them? And how do we plan this for the future? This is a record document for after a hurricane or a significant storm surge event happens, we can actually have a conversation to see how the building was designed to it. Climate shocks are continuously making an impact in America and almost making America uninsurable. And a large number of insurance agencies are actually pulling back. 
This is an article from the New York Times this year. So how long will we be able to live this way? Will we ever, will we ever have to re resort to a level of human migration again? Today, there's over 376 million refugees displaced forcibly from climate-related events. In addition, there's a number of refugees in war-torn related events. In Syria in 2011, 14 million. In Ukraine, we have about 6.5 million. And in Palestine, unfortunately, almost 7 million. It's estimated that we'll have 2 billion refugees by the year 2100. We can't unknow this. One of my mentors said this to me a long time ago, and she said, Arlen, once you know it, you can't unknow it, right? In addition to all these challenges, we're seeing global pricing, global carbon pricing extending. And this is bigger than climate objectives as well. We're seeing countries taking firsthand steps towards forcing carbon emitters to pay a carbon tax. So the countries that you see in, in this cyan color, as well as the blue color, these are countries that are making significant advancements to try and do something about this. We have the capability to mine Earth's resources from anywhere across the globe. We understand it's cheaper to purchase things from abroad. And we do it accepting the consequences that 40% of the built environment causes carbon emissions. Urban development is expected to double by the year 2060. That's like building something the size of New York City every four years. Emissions are essentially a symptom of consumption, and in order to reduce emissions, we need to, we need, we need to reduce our consumption habits. Our ancestors built buildings to last for thousands of years, where we have built buildings to last for 50 years. 90% of the projects that we build have, will be demolished or rebuilt in 50 years. This is a quote from David Attenborough. In order to restore our planet, we must restore our, our biodiversity the very first thing we removed. This is a, this is a sketch that totally inspires me. Uh, you look at COVID-19, an enormous problem, causing a recession, totally collapsing our economy, but then climate change is even worse, and then biodiversity from climate change. If you look at this from the UN SDG wedding cake model, it's very quite simple. We have the biosphere on the base which essentially supports all of life on the planet. And then we have society, which is linked directly to the biosphere. Without a strong biosphere, we don't have a strong society. Without a strong society, we don't have a strong economy. This, this map also says a lot as well. Understanding how to be more climate positive and look at the biodiversity loss curve. If you look at the top, this is basically business if you, look at, if you look at the bottom, this is basically business as usual. The one in the middle is essentially if, if we do something about increasing our preservation. And then the one at top, which is about literally transforming the industry and, and increasing our biodiversity. So these are four global design solutions that I think could really make an impact on a lot of these challenges ahead. We need to increase the way we look at regenerative design. We need to look at the way we design buildings for disassembly. We also need to look at that at a city scale. We need to look at AI technology and how that could potentially be an, a factor. And then in addition to that, tracking carbon. So for regenerative design, it's really about increasing the level of biodiversity we have on projects. And if you look at a typical city development, especially along the coast or along a port, most of them have poor air quality. There's, there's an urban heat island effect, and a lot of them are at risk from flooding. But with a climate positive design solution, we could potentially embrace the way we design with nature as a way to restore and enhance our ecology. We could focus on carbon sequestration and measuring that and developing tangible outcomes that allow us to look at the amount of carbon that, a lot of, a lot of the amount of carbon sequestration that we invest in our projects. We can reduce operational emissions and we could also reduce embodied carbon. The process is very simple. If you look at this, it's all about photosynthesis. The more plants, the more nature that we invest in, the more photosynthesis happens, and the plant respiration absorbs the carbon. 
As I mentioned before, design for disassembly needs to be at the forefront of our mind in the architecture industry. If we could understand how to, I could tell you right now that there is no city designed on the planet for disassembly, and most buildings are not designed for disassembly. If we can find a way to take the, the building materials and components that we create and think of them locally and, and develop them locally as we disassemble them over a longer period of time and reuse them for different components and different use, we could potentially save so much carbon in this process by reusing materials and recycling and diverting materials from a landfill. This is really about closed systems thinking. In addition, we're seeing legislation putting, pushing for carbon action. Legislation's pushing for LCAs, a life cycle assessment, which is happening throughout most of Europe, particularly in the Nordics. If you're building a brand new project in some countries like Denmark, you actually have to have an LCA on your project. So this is essentially something that allows you to track carbon metrics on the project as you're, put, as you're designing the building and choosing the buildings, choosing the building materials. It's about choosing bio-based bio materials and reducing the carbon. Our clients are asking for this, and it's a big part of the evaluation on our projects now. We need better data, in, we need de we need better data as an entire industry. And sustainable finance disclosure regulation reporting is certainly going to help us with this. This is something that is really encouraging our clients to ask for more when it comes to ESG. Artificial intelligence, such as using blockchain technology for future use, is going to be absolutely enormous for our industry. If we can develop a further assessment of material passports, which means when I take apart a building and I can use a QR code and scan the, the process of how that building material was made and where it came from, then I could potentially understand how to reuse it in the future. We're seeing an increasing demand for data centers across the globe as AI is continuously growing. And this could potentially actually have an impact, a negative impact on climate change as well. So we need more regulations that can support this. This is actually a rendering that I created in under two minutes. The only thing that I did using Dolly, I typed in these words in the bottom right and it gave me a visual. And my thought in my head is, uh, okay, well, I don't think it's necessarily gonna take away architecture jobs. I think we need to actually embrace this as a new tool. If we can communicate the challenges of climate change, the challenges of designing for disassembly, the challenges of tracking carbon, through the technology of AI at a faster rate and at a faster scale, maybe we could see an impact faster. So emerging technologies are absolutely transforming our practice. If we could find ways to create major incentives for cities and developers to increase allowances for carbon offsets or increase allowances for carbon sequestration, we would see a much bigger impact. Historically, if you look at France with their mansard roof, it wasn't, a taxable floor plan. it wasn't a taxable floor if it was considered a roof. If we could increase the floor area ratio, the increase the amount of development that a developer actually works on, but at the same time, if they increase it, they have to make a much more sustainable building, we would see an, an impact faster. These are some quotes that I like to live by. Human knowledge is always limited. You may think you know the solution today, but tomorrow it could be something completely different. There's no shortage of money. There's only a shortage of ideas. If we can spend a trillion dollars in revitalization efforts for extreme storms and events, then we can spend some money or a big chunk of money on building future flood-proof cities or future climate refugee cities. And the last quote, the best way to predict the future is to create it. Thank you.